All right. Is there a staff ready? Yes, we're ready. Directors, ready to begin again? Okay. All right. So returning from closed session, Josh, you want to report out? Yes, uh, there's no reportable action out of closed session. Thank you, President Jaffe. Okay. No public hearings. Uh, board members, it's an opportunity to remove items from the consent agenda. Okay, 4.8. All right, Are there, is there public comment on 4.1 through 4.7 and 4.9 and 4.10? Okay. Thank you, Becky Steinbruner. I had written your board and asked you to pull item 4.9. Are any of you willing to do that? Nobody. Uh, All right, no one it. wants to pull it. Well, I, I think can, it's rather remarkable. You can remarkable. comment on it now, though. Sorry? You can comment on, on that item now. I shall do that. Thank you. Um, I think it's rather remarkable that the uh, RFP for the laboratory services for Pure Water SoCal project is on the consent agenda. It's a large part of your, your agenda packet. What uh, I did send you correspondence about my concerns regarding what I've read in item 4.9, the RFP. What bothers me is that there's no inclusion of biological organisms to be analyzed and uh, recorded or reported um, in the either the, um, the water that would be injected into the groundwater, the very high quality groundwater, and also not at the treatment plant. I sent you a link in that correspondence about um, biofouling and how regularly testing for certain types of bacteria can be indicators, early indicators of biofouling, which not only impair the water quality, but also increase the energy requirement for the reverse osmosis membrane filtration. So I'd like to ask that you do include that in the RFP. I also um, want to point out, because I don't have much time, I hope you'll read my correspondence. I, I took a lot of time to put that to you, and I ask that you consider it. Item 4.2 in uh, page 20, there is a, a mistake in Tier 3 reporting. It says for May. I think it should be for July, as is reported for Tier 1 and Tier 2. Um, I'm happy to, see, happy to see the Chrome 6 pilot plant going on online. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that possible error to our attention. All right. Um, any directors have any comments on everything but... Uh, 4.8. I'll move approval of all but 4.8. Second. The who and Christensen. All in favor? Oh, wait, did you have something you wanted to say? I was going to say aye. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all in favor? Aye. aye. All opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay, so that brings us to oral and written communications so this is an opportunity for the public to talk about items not on today's on not on tonight's agenda and I see somebody there <laughs> thank you Becky Steinbrunner uh, during the closed session I was uh, interested in the correspondence and the agenda and things that are posted out in the lobby here and notably the agenda for these meetings are not. They used to be posted in all of the libraries, but they are not. I also uh, noticed upon coming back into the room and looking for some um, page numbers, the, the graph that I talked about, uh, to talk with you about, uh, the correspondence is not included in the notebook in the back of the room. I request that you do include correspondence in your agenda packets that are made available to the public in the back of the room at your meetings. Also, regarding missing correspondence, I did write your board um, after your last board meeting um, 
about uh, the, I think it's $45,000 that the district approved to have higher fences on the Chanticleer overcrossing. And um, I, I wanted to bring that to your attention because I didn't learn about it here. I learned about it in a Regional Transportation Commission meeting. And so I think it's something that should be discussed relative, um, President Jaffe, to your co comment at the last meeting that the um, aesthetic value of the fencing at the Overcross is, is good and that the district needs to do better. Um, so that's what caused me to kind of go looking for that. And I found, I found that correspondence. In the aesthetic um, analyses of the Pure Water SoCal project, Chanticleer Advanced Water Treatment Facility, the drawings showed trees and vines and all kinds of stuff. So um, perhaps President Jaffe's staff will uh, answer your comment and provide at the next meeting what it is scheduled to look like when construction is finished, if it has been altered. And I know that members of the public would also be very interested in that. Um, I believe that's all. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. I did see your correspondence about the fencing. You, you did receive did. it? Thank you. Did all board members receive it? And when did you receive it? Um, I don't recall. Okay. It was recent. All right. Thank you. All right. Any board members um, want to uh, have oral communications? Seeing none, we'll move on. Is there a report from district council tonight? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, have uh, one uh, update on a recent uh, opinion from the California Attorney General um, regarding uh, the Brown Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, and the question before the um, AG was whether uh, directors and other members of a legislative body um, were entitled to a re reasonable accommodation under the ADA to attend a meeting remotely um, from a private location. Um, so as a reminder, under the Brown Act, there's really two ways that directors can attend meetings remotely. Um, the first is under what we call the traditional teleconference rules, um, where your location, where you're attending remotely is listed on the agenda um, and is open to the public. Um, the second is under AB 2449, which is a holdover um, from some of the changes we saw during the uh, uh, COVID pandemic. Um, in those situations, directors can attend remotely from a private location in just cause or in an emergency um, for a certain number of, of meetings each year. Um, and there's a requirement um, from those locations that you appear um, both on video as well as disclose anyone over the age of 18 in the room uh, with you. And we've taken advantage of that a couple of times. Um, so uh, the reason I kind of went through that long background was um, this isn't the first time the Attorney General's been asked this question. Um, and in prior opinions, the AG has said that there is no requirement to provide um, a reasonable accommodation to allow directors to participate from a, um, a remote location uh, without listing that on the agenda or the traditional teleconference rules. Um, given the changes to the Brown Act in AB 2449, in this most recent opinion, the AG flipped um, and determined that there is now a requirement to provide a reasonable accommodation in those cases, um, recognizing that the Brown Act's changed. Um, and because we allow directors to attend from private meeting locations under those rules, um, a reasonable accommodation um, um, should be provided uh, with the caveat that directors essentially follow the same uh, rules that are required and specifically that they appear on video during those meetings and they disclose the identity of anyone over the age of 18. Um, I just wanted to flag that both for directors as well as for members of the public. Um, this is not something that's technically in the Brown Act, um, but is something we could take advantage of in the event we had a director um, with a qualifying disability. Um, and in the event you think that that may be something that applies to you or, or you know, we think it may be um, something that you should consider taking advantage of, we'll make sure to reach out. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Josh. Yes. Yeah. Can it be a temporary disability? Yes. When he had his knees? Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anything that would affect a director's ability to appear here in person. Um, 
Hmm? Thanks for asking that, but no surgeries planned in the near future. <laughs> Um, my doctor tells me eventually. Okay. You never know. <laughs> All right. Um, that brings us up to administrative business. There's no conditional or unconditional will serves. And so now item 7.2, review and provide direction on special board assignment status report. And yes, and I think I'm going to start off this one, and Melanie's going to um, jump in if, if needed. Um, she wrote the memo, so thank you for that. A little background, probably about 15, 18 years ago, some of you may remember, the board requested this list. And I think it was more out of just making sure we kept track of everything. And it's, and it's lived that long. Um, it doesn't move that fast sometimes. Um, sometimes it does. But really what, what we heard uh, a little while back was to bring this list in front of you uh, to see what items maybe we could we can knock off. I know the um, there's one on here, district new name. Maybe I'm hoping maybe we can let that one go. That'd be awesome, um, for at least for now. But um, you can always bring them back. But if there's anything you want to add to uh, as a board that we've kind of been missing and maybe you've been thinking back in the back of your mind, we could add on there tonight. So or any other modifications. This is kind of your list. Um, and we want to make it what, what serves you well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, public comment? None? All right. What's your, Tom, you've got something. Yeah, I just, you know, I know that it's not a big, big item, but I do think the aesthetic look of Pure Water SoCal, including the screenings that don't look like anything, um, could be on this list or is it on some list? I just want to make sure that doesn't get forgotten because I think we should bring those drawings back and then ask the artist and say, hey, take a walk on that bridge or look at the other bridge and then compare to what we got and it's just blobs of blue. <laughs> so I don't know, wherever some list. So that's a possible one for this. I think it's appropriate that we could add it to this list. Okay. okay. like to comment I didn't it's been in place since I joined the board and so I always took it for granted but it, it could be more comprehensive uh, you know with those kind of items there's a couple of things that we don't want to lose track of and the board should be kind of aware of you know what's happening um, I was surprised thirty five thousand dollars for fundraiser <laughs> that's just a brief example to do. Yeah, I, I like that we've got the, you know, the, the, this, this list, and I agree with what you said, Ron, that we don't need to rename the district at this point. I'd be okay with dropping that one, too. <laughs> um, and the water transfer pilot. Yeah. And that was the other one I was going to bring up. Yeah. I don't think it's, at this point, something that, I mean, how many times have we been offered water by the by the Santa Cruz? I don't think. It's been a while. I don't know. Because the, they have the conditions that Loch Lomond is overflowing and other conditions that they just haven't offered us water. So, um Maybe it, it would be something to bring back up if, if water is actually offered by a district. So I'm, I'm good with that one being taken off. Looks like um, the other ones I didn't, I thought were still appropriate to be on the list. Mm -hmm. Rebate. Although, for the rebate, maybe it could be more general. And if this is a big ask, when it, you know, it's easy for me to say, you know, add this. But um, please let me know if it, it's too big an ask and, and the, the staff time 
He's too stressed to, you know, move here. And so in that case, it could, it could be, you know, delaying. Yeah, I actually think that item has been uh, probably investigated, the, the okay. rebate one, but we just haven't reported out on that. Okay. Shall we go? But I, I will, if I may add, if, while you're looking there, one thing that might be helpful, um, and I say this as Melanie takes the reins, is I, I always, my intent was if I ever heard anything that I thought you meant to be on here, if it was in passing, to add it, right? But I was never quite sure. It, I try to treat everybody fairly, so it didn't matter who said it. Mm -hmm. But it might be helpful if you have that item, Either, either that's the way you want to go, and Melanie can be the, the capture, or any other staff said, "Hey, I heard this. You know, let's add it to the list." Or you bring it up, see if you get consensus. Not necessarily a motion that you want that going forward, uh, because we do do work on it. You know, so I just want to make sure it's that, you know, it, it's where you want us to focus. Uh, okay. yeah. Sounds reasonable. There usually, I my recollection is when there is some some feedback when. Items are asked. A lot of times there is. That's correct. You're right. Immediate. Okay. Um, I think that's all you need on this. I think so. Yeah, we got direction. We'll, we'll take off uh, the district naming um, under O and M A the transfer purchase price thing, and uh, we're adding uh, the screens. That's what you got. Right, and we, we are asking it by motion, um, and just in terms of this item. Yeah. Um, let's see, would, you were the one that, that wanted adding, but would you consider also checking on the landscaping that, that's on, on track? I think, I think just um, to follow up on the overall aesthetic plan for, for Purewater SoCal, but obviously the screens are the most obvious right now. Uh, some of the stuff I know can't be done until it's done. A lot of plantings can't be done until it's finished. But yeah. so. we don't want to put up a structure that's a so, motion. So add, adding that one then. then so that's a motion then? That's a motion. Okay. And to remove the items that were just. And to remove those two items that were mentioned. Was there just two, right? Just two. The renaming, renaming of the and, and, and the water transfer water price. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. <clears throat> you can argue. How do you count? <laughs> <laughs> it's mine. Okay. Shell wants it. Who made right. that Can we get a clarification? Who made the motion? I it was second. Tom, made it, and Rochelle. Took the okay. yeah. I just took more words to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Passes unanimously. <laughs> Okay, so now we're moving on to uh, uh, the modification organizational structure and staffing, executive management. Okay. Yes, and I'm going to take that one too. Uh, so this is being brought for you forth to you tonight as we enter uh, preliminary negotiations with the management team and some things have uh, arisen and uh, have gotten support from them on this item. But... It's, it's basically looking at the, are we compensating uh, the management team appropriately? And what falls out of this is there are two outliers when you go and look at those uh, comps. And one is uh, not paid enough, and the other one may, position may be paid a little more than we think is, is appropriate. And so uh, in that the one not paid sufficiently is the uh, finance manager. And the one that in the future, not currently suggesting to alter the, the um, salary, um, but is the HR manager. And also to move that not as a separate manager like that I have the departments, but under the administrative wing where the board clerk, the GM, um, outreach will sit to give them a little bit of a home. We think that's more appropriate um, since they have no people reporting under them. Uh, Melanie, anything else you want to add? Okay. Any public comment on this? Um, Go ahead, Becky. 
Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I would like to also um, take this moment to remind the board that the director of finance, the um, director of engineering, and um, Ms. Schumacher are all getting monthly bonuses that began retroactive to when the Pure Water SoCal project came, How's and this affects their this pay. This, this affects their pay. So I think it is um, germane to this because you're talking about the pay, you're talking about increasing the finance director's pay, and she is getting $1,000 a month as is um, engineering, and Miss Melanie Mouse Schumacher is getting $1,600 a month, month bonus, and we'll do so until Pure Water SoCal comes online. I just want to refresh your memories that that's happening. Thank you. See the point. Connection. Okay. No other public directors? Anybody over there in that area? Jennifer? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, we got a um, an email addressed to the board from the shop steward from SEIU, Brian Kino, and I just wanted to kind of share a little bit just to kind of bring it up because he wanted us to talk about it during this um during this discussion and he says that the members are frustrated and apprehensive about the changes coming their way and you know just to kind of summarize it you know he's talking about um you know wanting more uh, pay for the workers and uh, more staff more experienced staff so i just wanted to kind of put that out there for the workers thank you thank you yeah, I, I mean, I'm trying to look on this org chart, and I can't see Becca anywhere there. Well, Tra it's, it's, it's Tracy's position, the HR manager. But where's public outreach? Oh, do we, do we not move it over on the, I'll pull that. Sorry, Becca. Wait, you're above everybody? <laughs> yeah, it's on the screen there, Todd. Uh, Sorry. Oh. I, I had some questions about You're the chart too. Yourself. Well, I'm. And the arrow is moving up. Oh. I'm moving up. Okay. I'm Are you going to be off to the side? To admin. You're going to be kind of off at an little angle then off of that box. Okay. <laughs> oh, that big box. <laughs> <Hey>. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I, I thought it would be tied to an admin, and I was looking. And the the arrows that are going left and right are moving into different. Got it. Okay. Okay, but I, I could not understand the, I didn't understand um, the left part of the chart where it looks like there's two, there's duplication. Um, the, the column on the left and the column just to the right of that, to the ones that are under O and E, O and M supervisor and O and M supervisor, are those old and new? President Jaffe, we actually have two operations and maintenance supervisors. Okay. One of them is the supervisor of the distribution crew. The other is the supervisor of the operations crew. Okay. So these are not duplicative. Okay. The other question I had was um, there's a box by itself that's not connected to anything in the middle. This the associate manager for water resources. Yeah, that's that is actually connected. Um, oh, it doesn't have the black line. Just missing that black line going to the left that's there. Just missing. Yep. You're, okay. Good eye. Thank you. I, yeah. Man, I forgot to add that. Now the the arrows have been explained. Yeah. And, and, and in the bigger context, this is the, just the evolution of the organization. Have you seen it? And, with adjustments every time somebody leaves or something big happens, we, we like to take reflection and, and make what we think furthers. I'll venture to say this won't be the last. I'd say that's safe. In the organizational uh, structure. Yeah. Well, I had one more question okay. about um, staff analyst 0.7 FTE. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that is not a typo that. No, no. Works 0.7. Yep. Point seven. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Board approved. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Excellent employee. We we accommodate it and works for everyone. That's 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 all I have. My, I will say that um, on matters like this, I heavily rely on the general manager and assistant general manager for coming up with what makes most sense for our staffing plan. Thank you. We work hard at it with Tracy, too. She's instrumental in this. Um, certainly going to be missed. On, uh, so there are some... Yeah, there's Oceans. yeah, in kind of the A B C D format. Does anyone want to make any of the motions? Sure, I'll have a um, stab at it. So, by motion, um, we approve the revised three-tiered executive management salary schedule as presented, and the revised org chart showing the HR manager position moving to the admin department and eliminating the special projects communications slash assistant general manager from the staffing plan effective on October 1st this year, reducing the total executive management full-time equivalent from six to five, and the executive management job descriptions revisions as presented here and described, and the recruitment of the HR manager position at the proposed allocation and maintaining the incumbent HR manager at her current salary schedule placement through December 31st, 2024. Okay. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. <laughs> that was a favor. I had it turned off. I just oh, thought okay. I'd... Okay. So, so that... I turned mine off too. No, no, that was an aye. aye. A late aye. Unanimous, yeah. Sorry, I, I messed it up. Aye, aye. Okay. That brings us to 7.4. Receive information on communication and outreach during emergencies. I think this is what you asked for, Jennifer. Yeah. So, so is this you, Becca? And Melanie, we're in the we're okay. teaming. So yes, we're, we're pleased to present um, item 7.4 tonight. It was brought up um, earlier this year related to more information and an overview of the outreach activities that the district conducts during emergencies. We were first going to do a just a, a memo, and then we thought it might be good to do a PowerPoint presentation with some pictures. Um, again, you know, Becca and I are going to present this. But it is, you know, if you have questions, please feel free to, to stop us um, and we can kind of answer as we go along. We are going to use an example of the recent um, water main break that happened in January in Aptos. So just high level, um, you know, before we get down into the example and more of the, the tools and how the district engages in communication, just wanted to point out, you know, I think one of the um, main tenants of the district and some of the things that we focus on is outreach uh, and communication with our customers. Um, obviously, these are very important, and these are just some of the one reasons why we really emphasize the importance of communications and outreach. Uh, number one, we always want to make sure that we're, we're expressing it and staying with the public safety issues. Um, we want to make sure that the information is accurate. Um, there's a lot of sources of data out there, not just us, but others. And so, especially if it's related to the district, we want to make sure that we are pushing that information out. Um, the third one, obviously, is, you know, uh, we work hard on maintaining the trust and commitment to the community and our customers, so we prioritize outreach. And then, of course, coordinating response efforts, um, especially when there's an emergency or an issue that incorporates multi-jurisdictions. Um, you know, for example, near and dear to one of the ones that re was recent was the Bates Creek um, emergency that had a lot of different jurisdictions. Um, minimizing impacts, right? We want to try to um, remediate the issue that often um, re requires continuous outreach um, so that we can 
um, address it and then get that information out. A regulatory compliance, the outreach often is driven by regulatory compliance, so we want to make sure that we're meeting that. And then, of course, there's the post-recovery efforts. Once an emergency situation is mitigated, we've handled it, uh, we want to make sure that we close the loop on any outstanding outreach that's there so that we can make sure that everybody knows the information. We also want to do kind of a reconnaissance of evaluating our techniques at the end. Issue? Sorry, we use a variety of methods of outreach and communication. And so on this slide, we're get, in our presentation, we're going to talk about the who, the how, and the when for the Aptos break and how that all broke out. Um, so for the who, it's the affected customers, our general public, emergency responders, state regulators, and the media. The how, we use our website, emergency alerts, and the news functions social media, outbound phone calls and text, door hangers and barricade signs, and the when will tell you how, how long it took us to do those things. So our example is from the recent water main break in Aptos on Hunting, was it Huntington? Huntington and Wallace. Wallace. So the call comes in into the emergency after hours and then the on-call staff member responds and assesses the emergency and contacts the supervisor about what's going on on the ground, what needs to happen, and then the response team is enacted. So the first thing that happened in outreach was we put a notification on our website with an emergency alert banner. We love the website because anyone can access it. It's immediate, it takes two minutes to do that, um, and that on this example, um, this was put up within the first two hours of the emergency. And you can see in the yellow is the, what the emergency alert looks like. It's that black bar that goes across the top. And that's on every page of the website, not just the front page. So if you happen to be surfing for other information, you would still see the emergency alert. I think just to tee up, you can see on the, the banner, it says emergency alert, it talks about the date, and then it says read on. So the next slide that Becca's gonna go on is, if, you were, if we were to simulate pressing the read on, this is what um, a viewer would see. Thank you, Melanie. There's also on our front page of our website, the news articles on the left-hand side to the calendar, and there was a link to this page as well. So if you happen to miss the emergency alert, but you're looking at the news, you would also be able to click to this page and get this information. Um, and this is automatic. This happened with the emergency alert. And so when we go into the website to put that emergency alert on, we put this information and all of it is published at the same time, if that makes sense. So it's simultaneous with the black bar going across the top and then this information being published. So this was the middle of the night when this went out? This was posted at 10.40 p.m. Okay, so, so it wasn't too late. Right. But you get a call from the, the staff saying, "There's, we need you to post this now. Right. The call came in somewhere around 8 or 8.30. The on-call person responded. He contacted the supervisor, I believe. Nick, our operations manager, then contacted Taj. They kind of assessed the situation looked at the maps, looked at the as-builts, as tried to figure out how to identify it, and then reached out to some of the communication staff, Becca, myself, and then Leslie and Valerie. Another cool feature on the website is text alerts as well as email alerts. So if you sign up for those alerts, they will be texted to your phone, as you can see here on the right-hand side. Um, I think, was this your, this is your cell phone, right, Melanie? This is my cell phone. So I'm signed up to receive alerts. I know when the board packet gets pushed out. I also know if there's an, like an emergency situation. You can sign up for alerts for news items, emergency alerts, pretty much anything we publish, you can get an alert on if you want to. Are there many people signed up for emergency alerts? There's 13 for text and 22 for email, so not a huge amount. We have but to that says to me. About that. Yeah. Well, I was just talking to Melanie about this, right? So PG&E is a great example. Like I never signed up for alerts from PG&E until the first time I lost power as a homeowner. And then I signed up for it. So we don't have a ton of main breaks, which is 
great. So I think that's also why we're seeing a low number of, of signups. We've got to get more people aware of this because I'll bet you many, many people would sign up. It's a great feature. Um, you know, I think one of the things over the years working with this board is about not just the tools that we develop and employ, but the metrics. So quantifying, you know, how many, how many people are getting the uh, views, how many people are accessing the website, how many counts are there on, on other things that we can push out. We, we knew we may be asked of this. We try to get the information and we can try and work on it. Um, it's very hard to get people to sign up for some things. Um, yeah, my take is I'd like to see an opt out for emergency alerts. Interesting. Well, we can talk about that when we get there. Yeah, I can. We can talk about. Yeah, um, we. Can. I also want to point out what I didn't say is on the news and the alert um, from the website, the the slide beforehand. We had three hundred and fifty five views over the the two days of of the emergency, which is pretty good. So next, we also pushed out information on Facebook. We know um, this is a social media frenzy for most people. That's how a lot of people get their news these days. So what we love is that once we push out, then people can also share to the groups they belong in, such as Aptosia, which has over 27,000 members. And so it, it's like anything on social media. It can multiply quickly at a very fast rate. And so this also went out within the first two hours, and then we made updates as it went on. Through our, <coughs> excuse me, our billing system, we have an outbound call and text system that we can set, um, send texts and phone calls to. And so I talked to Valerie today to actually get some more information about how, how that all works. And actually, everybody is opt, opted in in our Tyler for emergency. Um, those 99 customers that we say have opted out um, of, this, of this actual example, they're auto pay customers. And so our auto pays are the only ones that are opted out because at the district currently, we send out reminders to pay your bill two days, a phone call two days before your bill's due. And so we don't do that for auto pay customers because they had a lot of complaints of being called, of that their bill was due and they're like, but we're on auto pay. So that's what those 99 are, the, our auto pay customers. This went out within the first three hours. Um, Valerie and Leslie got this out. Unfortunately, we didn't know until the morning that the calls actually didn't go out. Looked like it did in the system when they sent it, and then in the morning they had to troubleshoot with the billing company to find out why. This was a technology issue that, one, we identified, two, Valerie tried to fix and correct, and we pushed something out, and three, we've worked into our system some lessons learned. So Becca just kind of gave an overview of the outreach activities and communications that we did from basically when the main broke at 8.30 till about 11.45 at night. Then the crews were going to work. They, we kind of checked in with Nick at the end of the night. and He said, we'll probably be working through the night. Let's, let's check in in the morning. When we woke up in the morning, Nick had already kind of texted several of the managers about the, the latest status, which was that they had... Um, isolated the main break at about 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, 70 of the homes were able to stay on service. 70 of the customers um, did have a main repair, but we needed to work with the D Division of Drinking Water on um, issuing a boil order notice. So that is standard, standard uh, process. Uh, that's part of that regulatory compliance that we talked about. And through that, we, we prepare a boil order notice the Division of Drinking Water has to approve it. And then once we have the approved boil order notice, then we engage again on a second round of outreach activities that Becca is going to go over. Once that boil um, water notice was approved by the state, we went ahead and posted on our website again 
on social media. So those texts and emails went out from the website and the notifications of that update to the website, as well as I believe the outbound calls and texts. And since Valerie had fixed it, then those calls all went out. So if anybody went onto our website, what we tried to do is if you looked at the latest news, we kept the last post on there. So chronologically, they could see how things were updated. And we would put updated with the time so they knew exactly when we were updating the website. In addition to those, those things we normally do with the website, the text, social media, the outbound calls, we also did door hangers to, to all of the residents and customers, um, as well as the barricade signs that you can see in the picture there. I meant to bring the door hanger and I forgot, I'm sorry. Um, if you've ever seen one, you should, we stapled the boil water notice to it and hung it on their door. So. And then once the boil, our boil notice, boil order notice was lifted, we went and did the same thing again. Updated the website, those texts and emails went out. The outbound phone calls and texts from the Tyler system went out. Social media was updated, put out the canceled boil water barricade signs, as well as put another door hanger on those customers' doors, letting them know that the boil order was canceled. So I think at this point, and just kind of wrapping up, we wanted to share some of the lessons learned of, of those uh, outreach activities that went on during this emergency, as well as get feedback from you. Um, first of all, um, the first one obviously was we, we wanted to note that when an emergency situation occurs like this, we want to make sure that we tell the general manager. One, as I'm getting going into that role, I want to make sure that I know so that we can inform you. But in this time, a lot of times we have, we have managers that we feel are very qualified to do the work. We didn't want to impact Ron. I think Ron knew, but again, these are late. So, you know, people go to sleep, right? Um, so lessons learned on that. We just want to make sure that the, the line of communication between the general manager and the board um, through this process, if you have questions, you can always reach out to the general manager, and the general manager would be that point of contact during the emergency until it's complete. Um, we also recognize that we have multiple staff members um, who help facilitate outreach. We have a lot of different technology and tools that are out there that Becca mentioned, Facebook, our Tyler billing system, WaterSmart, et cetera, et cetera. All of these have usernames and passwords, and sometimes they have logon privileges. So we want to make sure to eliminate any pinch points related to that. I know the website because we helped develop it. I don't know all the ins and outs of the website anymore. So just making sure that we either have multiple um, staff members trained or that there's procedures written out that anybody can, can access Redundancy. if needed. Um, why don't you go over the third one? So Valerie did figure out you can override that opt-out for those auto pay customers and manually send the notification through Tyler. Um, so she has to go through every single customer by hand to do that. Um, however, we, she, she'll do it when we need to. Uh, we are looking into other ways of making that easier for our customer service staff and other staff that are trained to get those calls and texts out with possibly maybe eliminating eliminating the phone call two days before your bills. But well, that's something that staff needs to talk about and see if that's an option because then everyone would be opt in and she can just pull the addresses and send immediately. It's definitely an area that we're, we think that there can be some improvements and we're looking into how the technology can assist with that and what the opportunities or limitations are. We also learned that we should send those outbound calls and texts to some, to at least a couple staff members so we know if they go out or not. That's another lesson learned from the Tyler system because Melanie and I are both signed up for the alerts on the website and we knew those went out. But when you go through the system and it was identifying customers, if you weren't a customer, 
we we weren't getting it. So now um, Valerie, you, you know, can add her contact information so she would get that. Um, the door hanger one is one that we actually have some lessons learned on that. Um, you know, I think uh, Ron had a recent experience um, in his neighborhood in terms of, of a main break. And so, you know, we have all these methods. We definitely have, you know, we can do far reaching, but the ones that we really want to make sure that we're communicating with are the people who are most impacted. I think, you know, this is kind of what was brought up with Director Balboni kind of asking us this is because I think we were trying to figure out our, how can we improve or what are the ways where some of the methods that we did maybe weren't being realized or recognized or had that direct penetration. The door hangers was one that we did realize. Uh, we had a, our customer service field put out on that next day. The main was repaired. The boil order notices went out at 7.30, 7.30 to 8.30. The barricades went out and then they did the 70 door hangers. We then had to wait for DDW to clear the water, that it would, had passed the, the, the necessary number of back tees and that line could be put in service. And then we went through and we did a second round of door hangers that Becca mentioned. When our staff went around and notified those 70 impacted customers, there were quite a few homes that still had door hangers still hanging on their doors. So we're not sure if those homes are vacant, if they use a different access point, if um, we, we don't know why, but but there was a, an ineffectiveness on some of the door hangers that we realized that we felt that that is like the most direct, like person delivering a notice. Um, I think that's why, you know, it, we try to emphasize, I know we've done some improvements on the barricades. Previously, before Becca, whenever we had an emergency break and our crews would go out with barricades, we'd be printing things off of our big plotter and making them really customized. And, and then, you know, if it's raining or whatever, they got damaged. And Becca was like, we need to make these vinyl so that the field crew have them. And so we have like, they're ready and, and we've made an improvement. And I think that is one way that we might be hitting more people. And we've talked about that. Like not all, you know, more than the 70 people that are affected are gonna see a boil order notice. And then they may not actually have it and they may call but in that, that, those instances, it might be better that we have a little bit overreaching, and then they can call us, and then we can say, oh, let's, let's look you up, and you're not affected. When you put the, um, the hangers on, do you knock at the door? Yes. Okay. I actually don't know if they knocked. We should check on that. I want to check on that. I, when I put them out, I do knock. <laughs> I know, I wonder, sometimes I think some people just want to just do it because they don't want to deal with anybody mad. Right. Mm -hmm. No, it's a good point. I will check on that so that as we start doing this, we, we really are trying to write some SOPs so that, you know, um, any staff that does that, they kind of know the, 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 thank you. Oh my gosh. Yes, standard operating procedures, SOP. Um, another suggestion. Another suggestion that we, we took from that also is to try to use Water Smart, right? We have, again, some different platforms of ways that we sign up customers and get their information. So the Water Smart platform is another, another tool that we're going to try to, to implement. Um, we also want to make sure that we're checking the social media platforms during the emergency. Um, we like to see that there were several times where it was shared. Uh, we also saw that there were comments. So just making sure that we have a staff person that is managing and overseeing the so social media platforms. And then I think the last one we want to we want to end on before we, we open it up to more comments is that um, we are trying to incorporate the pre planning with staff so that we continue to be trained. We do have, you know, this type of emergency, but there are others. And as we have uh, new staff or staff takes on different roles. We want to make sure that we are periodically training and everybody knows where the resources are. All right, thank you. Any public comment? Yes, thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Thank you, Director Balboni, for bringing this uh, forward. And it sounds like it. Uh, 
the analysis is going to really improve things in the, in the future. It's always good to look back on what went well, what didn't, and why, so that you're better prepared for next time. It's very fitting to, to evaluate this. This is the, basically the four-year anniversary of the CZU fire. As you're talking about this, I'm thinking about the area where I live, the Aptos Creek Canyon. You have customers on Cathedral and those areas uh, that there is no uh, cell phone reception. There's, if there were an emergency, there would be no power. So I think it's really smart to use the, the barricades and, and very wise of you to get the vinyl ones that are ready, you can grab and go and are weather resistant. But I also want to um, ask that you push this out and maybe talk with water purveyors in areas that have had fires and earthquakes and what they learned so that you're not, uh, you can take advantage of, of what, has, what they have learned in true emergencies, earthquakes, fires, and also fiber optic sabotage, which our county has experienced a couple of times. So if people don't have a phone, they don't have internet, they don't have power, how would you reach them? So um, it's good to think about those things. And I know that you have, and I know that you will continue to do so. Um, I'm happy to hear that the um, AMI, uh, water smart technology could be used as a, a way to sort of relate back and contact people. I'm curious, a, a bit going back to those barricades, did you get any calls from people because of the barricades and wanting more information? Thank you. Thank you, Becky. You want to respond to that last question? I'm sure you did get calls. We did get some calls. Good. All right. Any questions, comments from uh, directors? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I figured you were on top of it because was, everybody was curious and monitoring, and, you know, what was going on. It was, it was, luckily, that was a singular event for us. So it, was, it, was, it is a good learning experience because I think when you're in an emergency situation, a lot of if you don't have a checklist, you get things just in the immediacy of the moment. But if you really already have control. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about your um, your trainings, you know, annual trainings, and I know winter may not be the only month time where you have these. So, but I was thinking that one, like doing them in December before the rains start coming in, in case there's washouts that cause the pipelines to break, might be a good time and. You could have them any time, I know that, but maybe at least that would be the most likely time that there could be something. Can't guarantee an earthquake's gonna happen at that time of year, but. No. <laughs> but. Nothing? No. Yeah, in this case, it was very unfortunate that the text didn't go out, so um, that was not great, but I love that we um, kind of, you know, are trying to make it better. It seems to me that um, a lot of the people that live in our town are, uh, quite a few of the people are um, not real tech savvy. So having all of these different types of um, approaches is really smart. And um, I would definitely love to see that um, texting be the main way of, of um, alerting people and um, to have the, you know, figure out how to um, get rid of uh, the auto text to pay the bills two days ahead and to actually have people have to opt out. I think that would be really smart. I think emergencies are coming our way, big ones, and to be really prepared is what we're, where the district needs to be. Thank you for your work on that very much. Yeah, there's a, a Malay proverb that I, I like on emergencies is prepare the umbrella before it rains. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So I'd, I would like to see um, more people on the emergency alerts, particularly with text. So whatever way 
you can make that happen. I think that'd be great. There's also, there is a, a county system and perhaps you can have, have a, you know, some link to that so that they send it out as well. And I had a question about, um, Becky brought up fires and earthquakes, infrequent events, hopefully. Um, but I'd, I'd be, might be too much to go into now, but at some point in the future, I'd like to see what our plans are for those. So I guess that gets on the list when people say definitely. <laughs> I have a question too. Special assignment. Special assignment. But, uh, you know, obviously decide when it's best to present. I, I have a question. It's kind of probably, I don't know, my inexperience working with the media. But how, does, how do you get on 11 o'clock news? It's very difficult right now with media, I feel, in general, because their staffing is greatly reduced, which has impacted their coverage. Um, it does seem that getting on the news is when something extremely dire has happened, and that's where we were like, okay, then maybe we don't necessarily need to be newsworthy if that's what sometimes triggers the news. Um, I think that you know we have seen, and it could be just the way that things are impacted, right? When we talk about some of our water emergencies that have occurred where we've gotten news um, and probably in the last two decades that I have been here. It's been, you know, the extreme one where we t a whole road washed out and people are stranded and, you know, the it got kind of federal and national attention. Um, we've also had it where uh, a well went out during the summer. Gosh, that was years and years ago. And um, we had to issue you know, a lot of notice that an area, it was limited water supply until we could get that well back online. So it's in those situations where it's a kind of a very critical situation is when we will definitely try to make more media. Becca and I, you know, we keep up the relations with the media crews. Uh, we provide them information. We will push out our own press releases, hopefully to get them captured. Um, but that's kind of been our, our past experience. It would be nice if they had a little banner. If you live in, you know, <laughs> the water outage <laughs> banner on the bottom. We don't have to talk about it, but at least it would be there so people would know. Mm -hmm. Anything else on this? All right, thank I, you very much. I think the one last comment, uh, we, we okay. took down a lot of great notes. We'll continue to improve and add those things. And I think just similar to the board's direction, related to increasing participation in Water Smart. You know, we have our newsletters, we have our e-blasts. Um, as we get into the winter months, uh, you might likely see that kind of key messaging. That's good. So we're running over two hours now, two hours and 19 minutes, and we have one more. I have two more items. Um, no, receive a presentation on Pure Water SoCal project, is that a, a long item or how long, how long is that? It, it does not have to be long. Okay. Just taking the pulse here. <laughs> that's, that's great. And uh, we, we... And if... if wants to shoot to slide? Okay. That, that I think obviously, you know, we, we appreciate the time to provide an update to the board. Um, this is one where we provided an update last year around July. Again, most of the activities are construction focused and Cameron is going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but we can be mindful. We have some photos. And really, we just wanted to take the opportunity to provide just, again, a project overview, which you all know, but sometimes we just like to hit it succinctly in case there are people who are watching this um, as a recording. Uh, Cameron will go through a construction activities update. We'll touch just briefly on outreach because it is such a key component of, of the project and then the schedule. Okay, thank you. 
So as, as many people know, and we continue to emphasize that the Pure Water Soquel is a recycled project that's going to purify treated secondary effluent from the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Plant. For sure. Uh, second, it's secondary effluent that the city of Santa Cruz puts out to the ocean. Okay. So. Yeah. Um, and then we will treat it to tertiary, like Doc, uh, Doc, Direct President Jaffe is mentioning. We will treat that to tertiary levels at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, but the majority of the water will be secondary effluent that goes to the uh, advanced water purification facility at the Chanticleer site. That's where the purified water will be generated and then go out to the three seawater intrusion prevention wells. Cameron's going to talk more in detail about the those uh, construction aspects and the status of it. Um, but again, just high level, big picture, the project is designed to produce up to 1,500 acre feet per year, 1.3 million gallons per day of purified water. That, <clears throat> that is to achieve both uh, protective water levels, create that seawater intrusion barrier, and replenish the groundwater basin for current and future uses. Um, and we also have the project to be designed so that the underground infrastructure, if expanded, doesn't have to go through the construction activities. Those have been sized for expansion um, if the project were to be expanded um, to, to more than that amount, though, the above ground facilities would need to be to be built out. We would need to do a project level EIR, go through that design effort, and then and then build it. Just touching on some of these, these are the kind of the key benefits of the project. We're obviously reducing ocean discharge. We're creating that seawater intrusion barrier I mentioned. This is a very reliable and drought uh, and climate-proof water supply, especially in times of rain or prolonged droughts. Um, this project was timely, if you guys remember. Um, it was actually August 26 of 2014, which we uh, recognized in the staff memo when the board directed staff to go forward. So we are just approaching the 10-year anniversary of this project from going from concept to uh, operations. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's, it seems like a long time, and yet it also seems like not a long time. Um, the project, uh, obviously, you know, with a reliable water supply will help support and promote economic vitality. This water is, is, is regula regulated by California. It's very uh, high quality uh, purified water. I mentioned it can be scaled up, and again, you know, we're going to be using um, the energy source that is, um, can be from a greener portfolio. And then I'm going to turn it over to Cameron, who's going to give you the update related to the current activities. All right. Thanks, Molly. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about the, basically the three elements, the uh, SWIP wells, the seawater intrusion prevention well construction. Um, and we'll also talk about the pipeline installation, or what we also refer to as the conveyance project. And then the treatment facilities, which it really includes, you know, the, the Title 22 um, treatment facility at the Santa Cruz, and then also the um, Chanticleer site, the Advanced Water Purification Facility. Um, so we've included some pictures here of some of the recent um, activities to give you an update on how the conveyance project has been going. Um, the pipes in the ground, they've been moving into um, concrete sidewalk restoration. They've been um, repaving all the areas um, and also on the Laurel Street Bridge, they've been putting in place the architectural covering and the, the fencing. Um, and then they've been um, doing some work on the um, tracer wires to facilitate with the pipe location for future. Um, moving right along to the, uh, this is a photos of the Santa Cruz uh, facility. This would be the non-potable Title 22 system that's um, being constructed. Um, so construction's pretty much um, wrapping up um, for that facility. Um, I just want to reiterate for this one that um, while this construction was occurring, um, the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Facility had to continue operating as well, um, since that is a, a critical facility. Um, and so we've been um, communicating a lot with the city operators and collaborating um, really well um, with them while all this construction has been happening. Some of the milestones um, recently, um, that site was energized um, for our pg and &E power um, in July, which really paved the way for us to move into some startup and commissioning activities 
um, which I can um, go into in some other slides as well. Um, but what you also see here is the source water pump station. Um, that Those are the vertical turbine pumps that are going to be um, providing the secondary treated effluent um, to the Chanticleer facility. Um, and then also there's a picture of a cloth filter, which is one of the first, or I guess it's the second um, kind of treatment step um, for the Title 22 system. Um, and then after that, you have your UV system. Um, and then they've also been doing um, paving around the site just to return it to um, conditions prior to construction. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this photo. This is the architectural rendering of the Chanticleer Advanced Water Purification Facility. Um, the site itself, it's, I don't have a picture right here to show it, but um, it's coming along quite nicely. It's looking very similar to what you see um, in the rendering um, here. Um, and, you know, just as an overview, um, this is where the secondary treated, or, yeah, excuse me, the secondary treated effluent from the Santa Cruz facility is going to be um, coming in for the advanced water purification um, process itself. Um, and then in some of the next slides, uh, I'm just going to cover some of the recent activities um, at the AWPF. Um, so photos here, we're showing um, some of the pipeline um, bringing source water uh, into the AWPF and also the pigging station. Um, for those of you who don't know, that pigging station was used to clean uh, the, um, the pipelines that were put in place um, prior to um, putting them into commission. Um, we've also had electrical equipment installed. Um, update on that, the site was um, energized in June. Um, and so that, again, paves the way for a lot of the startup and commissioning activities. Um, there's a shot of the ozone system, um, nearly fully constructed there. That's the first treatment step um, in the advanced water purification process. And then you're going to be followed by the uh, microfiltration, um, reverse osmosis. There's a nice shot of the feed tank going into the reverse osmosis or the RO system. And you have your ultraviolet um, advanced oxidation process there. And then finally on to the purified water tank. Um, all the systems essentially are constructed ex uh, with the exception of the microfiltration system. You can see there in the picture the membranes haven't been loaded in yet. That's happening um, this month, which is um, pretty exciting. Um, in addition to that, I wanted to also mention that um, equipment that's throughout the facility has redundancy built into it um, through standby units. Um, with the intention that, you know, if we have to take one of the units offline for maintenance, um, we can still continue to operate the facility at either full flow or um, at a reduced flow. One example would be in your RO system. There's two trains that you can you can see there in that picture. If one of those goes into backwash or it goes into a clean in place process, the other train will be online, and we can continue to produce um, RO what we call RO permeate to continue its process along tr uh, the treatment train. Um, and one other thing to mention, too, in terms of redundancy is um, there are several diversion paths within this treatment process that will um, send water to the reverse osmosis concentrate wet well, and then that will go back to the um, Santa Cruz uh, treatment facility as well prior, you know, so um, not being injected uh, into the groundwater. I'm going to do a time check. How am I doing? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. We have about, I think, seven slides left, so not that many. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, so then moving right along, um, we'll talk about the seawater intrusion prevention wells or the, the SWIP wells. Um, just as a reminder to folks, there's um, three wells um, that we have installed. What you're seeing here are some of the recent activities where they've been installing some of the pervious concrete at the sites. They have all the electrical equipment that's being installed. Um, they've been doing site paving and lighting. They've been painting pipes, um, wall painting, um, pulling wires, um, all sorts of stuff. Um, um, instrumentation and electrical, um, it's nearly 90% complete. Um, they've installed the factory tested electrical and control cabinets, pulled wiring, installed backwash tank float switches, which you'll see on the next slide. We got flow meters in, pressure transducers, et cetera. Um, the, oh, thank you, Melanie. Yeah, some of the control logic programming um, that is currently underway um, with our system integrator, um, Tesco. 
And for in terms of energization for these sites, um, what we're looking at right now is uh, early September with testing and training and startup schedule um, for October and November of this year. Um, here's a, uh, that's just a couple other slides showing some of the antennas which we're going to be using to send radio signals um, to operate that facility. Um, we've got float switches there in the backwash tank, and then there's some wellhead instrumentation there as well. Um, quickly, just an uh, update on some of the outreach activities, um, presentations and meetings that have been given since um, March of 2023. There's been 27. We've attended uh, 13 conference presentations. They've given seven school presentations, five community presentations, two meetings. Um, we've given uh, 23 tours um, since that same date. We've held 10 events. Um, and then... We continue to update the website um, at least twice a week, and we're giving e-blasts out on Fridays. And there's some nice photos of just some of the events that we've been holding. Did you want to say anything about the events? Okay. Okay. All right. Moving on to some of the other facilities um, that are on the Chanticleer site there, we have the Education and Operations Building or the, what we're calling the EDOP building. Um, we're remodeling that old glass shop that was there so that it becomes an education center, as well as the operations hub um, for our contract operators. Uh, earlier this month, we had a 75% design review um, with the architect that was selected for that project. And what we're showing here are some uh, preliminary renderings of what that um, building might end up looking like. Um, so it's a pretty nice looking facility. Um, a considerable upgrade from what it currently is right now. Um, and then we're continuing to give facility tours, um, or sorry, excuse me, to attend facility tours at other plants and gathering information from similar utilities like Pure Water Monterey, um, the WRD Albert Robles Center, and then Orange, Co Orange County um, Water District. In terms of contracts and agreements, most of you know, um, we approved the um, Jacobs contract um, in May. Um, tonight, we talked about the laboratory services RFP, or request for proposal that's going to um, go out. Um, and then also, um, we're working on a district and city operations and maintenance plan um, for the Pure Water SoCal facilities that are located at the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Facilities. So not just the um, non-potable system that's there, but there's other um, systems uh, that the district owns that the city has been um, contracted with um, in order to maintain, to operate and maintain through the life of the project. Um, and then in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of schedule, um, we put together a staff member to kind of highlight um, some of the past events that have brought us to that yellow star you know, where we are now. Um, and so I'm not going to go into too much detail on that um, in the interest of time, but I want to draw your attention to the construction and operations rows on there. The construction being in that dark blue, the operations being in the purple. Um, we're still technically in construction right now, even though the majority of the facilities have already been completed. And the reason for that is because startup and commissioning is a part of the construction phase. Um, and so you can see where the replenishment little icon is there um, in 2025. Um, that's, where our, that's what our goal is, um, March 2025, to be operational by then, to be replenishing the aquifer um, at that point. But we still have some rigorous testing that we are undergoing at all of the facilities to ensure um, that all the equipment is operating as it's been designed um, and that the systems are integrated and communicating with each other. Um, operations is overlapping with that construction because Jacobs has been an integral part of the construction process and um, providing feedback to the design builder. And they're going to continue to do so um, throughout the startup and commissioning process as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment? Thank you. Um, it's nice to see a presentation given by you, Mr. Costigan Mumper. Thank you. You are in charge of everything. All Pure Water SoCal is, uh, 
as Mr. Duncan had said earlier, I just want to say that it, is, it was a sad thing to hear that the board is considering taking off of projects water transfers with the city of Santa Cruz. That being said, I don't see anything um, about the conveyance part of Pure Water SoCal, other than just uh, putting on um, aesthetic screens on the Laurel Street Bridge, which I hope are not happening now during the migratory bird time. I do, I am aware that the system is designed to be doubled in capacity. So I'm happy to hear that the underground part is already set up for that. And um, I look forward to the water optimization study coming out that could uh, support um, expanding use of pure water SoCal and in fact, enlarging the system. Um, I have been going over old documents in the National Water Reuse Institute panel that was here in 2017, recommended you do a pilot project. You didn't do that. So here we are. I remember hearing you talk about off-ramps in your board meetings too, and here we are. Um, I am happy to see that uh, there's some, some attention given to aesthetics. I'm very happy to see that the fence at the Willowbrook uh, injection well has been remodeled to not look like a gulag next to the Montessori school. That was a good thing. And again, I want to urge you to make sure that there are testing for biological contaminants. That was one thing that the National Water Research Institute panel cautioned you about, CECs. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make a quick cor correction. What oh, please was taken do. off about water transfers was my ask to get a, a, a cost, including staff time for those. It's not taken off anything but the list for our staff on what to do. Thank you for that clarification. It wasn't okay. clear during your discussion. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, it looks like you wanted to say something or no? Is there anything, any questions or? Sorry. The panel, that panel was a very, it was a very um, educated panel, but they did not recommend that we do a pilot study. They said that we shouldn't do, we didn't need to do that because there has been so much work and research uh, that we could rely on that based on other people, other agencies, uh, pilot studies, that that's one of the things that was taken off the table, and it, it was very cost effective. All right. Anything else? Thank you for the presentation. I, I would just like to add to that, and it's been a while since the NWRA panel came out with some of their recommendations, but during the feasibility, the district did conduct some pilot testing down at the wastewater treatment plant, uh, specifically with microfiltration. All right. Thank you, Melanie. And just on the um, outreach part of the actual purification facility, just even though I know we're going to have movable exhibits for tours, I still think it'd be good to have signs that kind of say what, you know, this is re reverse osmosis, even if they're up high and out of the way, and maybe arrows that show which way things are going. Thank you, Tom. All right. So nice presentation, though. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. And thank you for keeping it. Uh, to the point. Uh, all right, so um, Jennifer reminded me that we have item 4.8 from the uh, from the um, consent agenda. Consent agenda. It's late. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I asked to pull the uh, consent agenda uh, consent agenda item 4.8. This item asks the board to approve an additional $300,000 in monies for litigation. This litigation has been brought forth by Rebecca Steinbrunner, who is not a Soquel Creek water rate payer. She has now filed a total of eight legal challenges, more than enough to ask the courts to declare Ms. Steinbrenner a vexatious litigant or someone who repeatedly files lawsuits that have little or no merit. Also note that out of the eight lawsuits, 
She has filed. Six have been ruled in favor of the district or dismissed. And finally, just to note that this has cost our district $1.2 million, and our district is funded by our rate payers. Thank you. Okay. Public comment. Thank you. I would love to respond to this. <laughs> Becky Steinbrenner, the litigant. I'm not a customer of SoCal Creek, but I do represent the public. This has all been pro part for public benefit. I'm not the only person that's worried about the effects of this project on injecting treated sewage water, and that's what it is. You can't get out a number of compounds, DEET, sucralose, that's why they're there for testing. And it will also inject nitrate and chloride at fairly high levels into the pristine aquifer. Many people think this isn't necessary. Many people are worried about the implications of health. We have doctors, my own, telling me don't drink that water. And we have seen that the costs of operation have gone up from an estimated $2.5 million a year to over $6 million a year. So I represent the public, the public interest and the environmental interests, which I think a lot of this has ignored. And the reason I've had to bring so many um, suits is because the district keeps changing the project, significantly so even though addendums are said to be insig insignificant changes, but they were huge changes, one of which was go not going under the San Lorenzo River when the Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board had problems with that. Instead, it went to the bridge. There have been no seismic analysis for the structural impacts of uh, fluid-filled tubes on both sides when the bridge has been significantly altered as well as what happens if there's a break and chloramine, which is not volatile, goes into the river. It is toxic to all aquatic life. So that's why I brought these things. I have come to your meetings, much to your chagrin, and ask questions and nobody ever answers them. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments by directors? Or? No, I was gonna make a, the motion, uh, both okay. motions. All right. And for, yeah, I'm sorry we have to spend, keep spending money, but I, we need to be responsible. Okay, let's not have back and forth, Becky. Um, okay, so. I'm approving, I'm just making a motion that we authorize the, the OCR funds for, for legal. Is there a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Nobody? Passes unanimously. So I believe that brings us to the end, unless I'm missing something. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. That's the best part of the meeting, right? No, I didn't get that. Did I miss it? Watch out. <laughs>